Hey listeners, this is Nick, and welcome to another episode of the Books of Some Substance podcast. Today, David, Nathan, and I are concluding our spin through Leo Tolstoy's War and Peace. We discuss things like the quiet heroism of General Kutuzov, or maybe it was the predeterminism of General Kutuzov. We'll settle that later. And then there's the notoriously philosophical and lengthy Epilogue Part 2, in which Tolstoy presents his views on the limitations of history and how we're all going to have to give up some free will and study up on a bit more calculus if we want to develop some reliable laws, you know, for this messy entity we call mankind and all. If you've been with us for all four of our War and Peace episodes, thank you. This one's for you. Enjoy. Reason tells us, one, space and all the forms that give it visibility, matter itself is infinite and cannot be imagined otherwise. Two, time is endless motion without a moment of rest and cannot be imagined otherwise. Three, the connection between cause and effect has no beginning and can have no end. Consciousness tells us, one, I alone exist and I am everything that exists. Consequently, I include space. 2. I measure the course of time by a fixed moment in the present, in which moment alone I am aware of being alive. Consequently, I am beyond time. And 3. I am beyond cause, since I feel myself to be the cause of my own life in all its manifestations. Reason gives expression to the laws of necessity. Consciousness gives expression to the essence of free will. Unlimited freedom is the essence of life in man's consciousness. Necessity without content is human reason in its threefold form. Free will is what is examined. Necessity does the examining. Free will is content. Necessity is form. Only by separating the two sources of cognition, which are like form versus content, do we arrive at the mutually exclusive and separately unimaginable concepts of free will and necessity. Only by bringing them together again do we arrive at a clear concept of human life. Beyond these two concepts, which share a mutual definition when brought together, like form and content, there is no other possible representation of life. All that we know about human life is a certain relationship between free will and necessity, or between consciousness and the laws of reason. All that we know about the external world of nature is a certain relationship between the forces of nature and necessity, or between the essence of life and the laws of reason. The forces of life in nature lie beyond us in our cognitive powers, and we put names to these forces. Gravity, inertia, electricity, the life force, and so on. But the force of life in man is not beyond our cognitive powers, and we call it free will. But just as the force of gravity, intrinsically unintelligible despite being sensed by everyone, is understandable only in terms of the laws of necessity to which it is subject, from our first awareness that all bodies possess weight, to Newton's law. The force of free will is also intrinsically unintelligible, but recognized by all and understandable only in terms of the laws of necessity to which it is subject, all the way from the fact that all men die to knowledge of the most complex laws of economics or history. All knowledge is simply the essence of life, subsumed by the laws of reason. Are, are we rolling on my summary? I have my last, my last paper summary. Is that how we're wrapping this thing up? Let's do it. Either we do it by free will, or this is just the inevitable course of events yeah. <laughs> for the listener base that after reading 1400 pages of war and peace is also interested in listening to four <laughs> hours of discussion on it <laughs> <laughs> okay so volume four begins with elena dying and dying of what did anybody pick up on that i think it was a morphine addiction Either way, everybody was just like, oh, it's so it's so sad to see her go. They just like totally glossed over it at the society level, right? We end up seeing uh, Nicolay ends up in the country and he kind of gets influenced by, I guess it's the governor's wife out there who's kind of trying to get him to marry 
to not to marry Sonia, but to marry Maria. And then there's the scene where Sonia is basically forced to send a letter to break it off with Nikolay at the same time that Nikolay is just yeah. praying for it, essentially. <laughs> Again, the combination of free will and destiny. Exactly. And it, the very quickness of the event seemed to prove the letter hadn't come from God as an answer to his prayers. It was pure coincidence. <laughs> and so he stopped praying. Exactly. It solved it. Uh, we then see, so Pierre is about to be executed, and then he's not. And then he meets that sort of simple gentleman uh, in prison who ends yes. up being like his guiding light because he's... Platon. Yes, Platon. Yeah. Indeed. And so it kind of like gives him a new lease on life in a way. Oh, man. Does anyone have... In the very beginning when Pierre meets Platon, Platon has these great like one-liners that I feel like yes. Nathan should render into motivational oh, yeah. posters. <laughs> uh w- we're at large, but God is in charge. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like clever, like, I don't know, colloquialisms for the common man. He's like, live, laugh, love. And Pierre's like, yes. Yes. <laughs> That's it. They'll get, they get turned into Julia Roberts movies. <laughs> Trouble short. Life's long. <laughs> uh, after that, Andre dies for real this time, I think. But what is that? What is, he, what is even death? Where is he gone? That's true. Well, he has his kind of revelation about what it all means right before, and it's actually it's actually sort of very sweet, right? I guess. You know, love is the meaning of it all. Love, here, I've, I've got that quote too. I'm, I'm on it today. Can I read that quote? Yes, you may. Love, what is love, he thought. Love gets in the way of death. Love is life. Every single thing I understand, I understand only because I love. Everything is, everything exists only because I love. Everything is bound up with love and love alone. Love is God. And dying means me, a tiny particle of love, going back to its universal and eternal source. Yeah. Uh, fun fact, the song you know that goes, What is love, baby don't hurt me? It's actually based on that line, the Tolstoy look. Is that true or is that another joke? If you want it to be true, you're allowed to believe it. <laughs> I mean, it could be. All right, moving on. Uh, part two. So we see that Napoleon's basically on his way out. And there's the that conversation about how for every brilliant move he made at the beginning, he's basically doing the most unbrilliant moves. So his genius has sort of run out in a way. Turns out that Pierre loves being in prison. It's like the happiest he's ever been. He loves that. <laughs> I guess, like, the simple purity of it, right? And even though he's covered in, like, lice and, and sores, he's just kind of into it. Yeah, to the point that when he's out of prison, he sort of just stays in this small shack for a while yeah. and just kind of chills. Right. That was his best life. Uh, and then basically, uh, so the French are sort of melting away. You know, uh, Kutuzov kind of wants to leave him alone, but the Cossacks you know, can't keep attacking in this sort of parallel and unorganized fashion. But it's basically just a waste of resources because the French are retreating anyway. And that leads into part three, where we have uh, Tolstoy inserting himself again, where he's talking about basically the tactics of guerrilla warfare and the concept that Russia broke all the rules, where when you have... Uh, an adversary who basically does the opposite of what everything is expected. It can basically turn the tables on everything. You know, sort of like George Costanza, if you do the opposite of of every single thought that you've had and every single thought that you had was was wrong, then the opposite must be right. And that's basically how Russia beat Napoleon. Mm-hmm. I'm just going to load this episode up with my pop culture references. Uh, <laughs> we have Petya showing up at like the tail end of, of the war. And he's so youthful and full of exuberance and he's naive and he just wants to be a soldier. He wants to be an adult and it ends up getting himself killed because of that. His, uh, his death was, like broke my heart. Which was unbelievably painful. I agree. I want to see if I can find that line. Because the way that he, because uh, you kind of know it's coming. He kind of shows up yeah. at the front line and you're like, what is he doing there? And uh, he's so enthusiastic and it's just like Tolstoy is just he's leading us to the gallows here. And when when he charges in, like the description of him getting shot was just I don't know, maybe I didn't highlight it. 
Doesn't he get like a basically like a hole in his head and kind of slides off the horse? Well, they they describe so he describes it kind of like a, like you as the reader see Petya, you know, ride past. So he's in front. You're like looking at him from behind, and he describes him as waving his arms around. Like I don't, he didn't say flamboyantly, but like kind of in this like almost like beautiful dancing sort of way. Petya was galloping through the courtyard. Instead of holding onto the reins, he was cleaving the air with weird and wonderful movements of his arms and slithering sideways out of his saddle. His horse stepped on the ashes of a campfire still smoldering in the early morning light and reared back. Petya fell heavily to the wet ground. The Cossacks could see his arms and legs twitching, but his head didn't move. A bullet had gone right through his head. Yeah, I mean... One of the best things about this book is we're ultimately going to talk about how Tolstoy uses it to put a different opinion of what history is out there, but it definitely gives the insight into the personal impacts of war and the personal tragedy. And that's probably one of the best moments Yeah, for that, as heartbreaking as it is. I, I think like what you're talking about, how the French had lost, and I think in, in history, this looks like... And, and I think, you know, he talks about the Russian generals besides Kutuzov wanting to just, like, give it to the French. Just, like, let's just wipe out as many of them as possible, like, for the glory of Russia and for the glory of soldiers. And I think that's kind of the way you look at it in a history book is, like, well, now the, the Russians are, are routing them and, you know, whatever. I don't know what the ratios are, but so many more French were dying than Russians. And this moment is like, yes, but a lost life is a lost life and there was no reason for mm-hmm. it. Well, there was a line, I think it was by... Katusov, he's with his other men, and he's like, let's not kill them, because they, like you, have mothers and fathers. Do you remember what I'm talking about? It's very brief. I vaguely remember that. <laughs> he, like, represents the sort of better parts of the Russian military. Mm-hmm. And he's among his men as they're chasing down some of the French. Yeah, well, I mean, that's a good... Could kind of transition into the next chunk. I mean, after the Rostovs are th- are thoroughly just devastated by Petya's death, essentially there's the section on on Kutuzov being kind of this quiet hero for exactly the purpose you're talking about, but also it gets into you know the concepts of determinism and free will about you know whether or not he actually was a hero who enacted anything for history, or rather if history and the momentum of it basically just used him. And then eventually Kutuzov, after having given everything, just kind of quietly dies. Essentially, history no longer needed him anymore, and he expires. I mean, Kutuzov's, uh, in my opinion, one of the best characters and, and kind of, I don't know, concepts in the book, right? Which is just, you know, the time and patience are a soldier's best weapons. Mm. But also, he completely, most of his actions are basically non-actions. They're, you know, don't attack them. We're going to give up uh, Moscow. We're going to do all of these things. We're going to wait. And so it, it's a great jumping off point for asking, was he doing anything independently? Was he just going with the momentum of history? Was he actually in charge? I mean, these are this is basically the concept of the book, in my opinion. I feel like we're going to get into this heavy in a little bit. And once we do, we're not going to find our way back out. So... <laughs> <laughs> Uh, okay, after uh, Kutuzov goes down, we have uh, essentially Pierre's sort of happy. He's he's experienced life. He, he reemerges and he turns out that uh, he wants to marry Natasha. And turns out Natasha wants to marry him. And the book essentially, or rather volume four, closes with them getting married and kind of starting their new life. And then we go into the epilogues, or rather the, the two parts of the epilogue. And you know, the first section is is a split between, you know, the classic characters and, and uh, some of uh, Tolstoy's insertion of himself for his commentary. And uh, so, you know, we get a little bit of that uh, in early in the first part of the epilogue where he's arguing that, you know, essentially there's no individual events that make up the cause of other events. It's all based on all of these contingencies. It's not a single thing. It's much more complex than that. And so that sets up nicely where part two is going to go. And then we get kind of a little overview of fast forwarding what what the lives of Pierre and Natasha and Nikolay and Maria end up looking like, because we see that Nikolay uh, basically inherits his father's death. 
and this kind of drives him into the ground and he he ends up marrying Maria, becomes kind of a shrewd landowner and works his way out of it, albeit with some questionable behavioral practices. And then, yeah, uh, yeah the, uh, he can't control himself and just, I found that to be a little amusing where he just can't, can't not fight people. And <laughs> his wife's just like, can you stop doing that? He's like, I just can't stop. <laughs> it's just what I do. And it seems to be a thing that's like not that big of a deal. I was like, I don't know. A little I think you should be PTSD, maybe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It certainly seems like that. His behavior is so chaotic. He's moody in his room, and then he's happy and joyous. And he's like, Oh, mm-hmm. I was never mad at you. What are you talking about? Yeah. What? <laughs> Where they don't want to wake him up from like his nap. They're like, Don't wake him yeah, up. Yeah, yeah, that's right. You don't know. <laughs> um, and we land on this sort of snapshot of Pierre and Natasha's relationship, uh, sort of juxtaposed with Nicolay's and Maria's. And you could argue that both relationships are happy, but they're different, right? Pierre and Natasha seems a little bit more idealistic versus Nicolay and Maria have, I don't know, I mean, they do seem like perhaps they're in love, but it, maybe it's a different version or more realistic. I don't know. It's got, uh, it's got some uh, relationship stuff to unpack there. And then part two, we've arrived at part two, which is the best part. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not even going to attempt to summarize all this because, hey, that's impossible. And I'm not even totally sure if Tolstoy ends up proving everything that he wanted to prove. But my main point would be that he's tackling the concept of causation and how it's not easily proven and that ultimately saying that there is no free will if we had the ability to treat history like we do mathematics, we can generate the laws that prove how history happens. But ultimately, it seems like we don't quite get to that because we don't actually have the skill and the infinitesimally small segments of history to be able to develop those laws. And so here we are. Can I read a quote right now that I think will set up the conversation we're about to have quite nicely? Yes. Sure. From that epilogue. Uh, part two. Is this the one about raising your arm? No, but that's another good one. <laughs> um, this one, I think, just kind of summarizes. It, I mean, so the, the, it kind of runs on and on. He, he keeps trying to get at the crux of this idea between uh, determination, causation, and free will. But I think this paragraph summarizes it reasonably well. In neither case, however much we vary our standpoint, However much we clarify the man's association with the external world, however accessible we think this is, however much we lengthen or shorten the time lapse, however understandable or opaque the reasons behind his action may appear to be, can we ever have any concept of absolute freedom of action or absolute necessity? Sorry, there were a lot of howevers right in the middle of that sentence. Let me just (laughs) read that sentence without all the howevers so it's understandable. In neither case can we ever have any concept of absolute freedom of action or absolute necessity. And I think that that's, that's why this, this section goes on and on because he's not actually saying there is or that we can understand, that we can come down hard and say that there is, absolute, there is anything as, such as absolute free will or absolute necessity, but that somehow they are both true and not true at the same time. Yeah, I think that... That's why I was thinking about that quotation where he talks about raising your arm. Actually, that's... I, I don't know where it is. It, that's actually right after this. That is where he sort of lays out how, yes, you have free will in certain actions, but in others you don't. Let me read that And real quick. maybe even in those acts of free will, what you think is free will is actually just something predetermined that allows you to believe you have free will. Mm-hmm. Can I lift my arm? I do lift it. But this sets me wondering, could I have decided not to lift my arm in that moment of time that has just gone by? To convince myself that I could, I do not lift my arm the next moment. But the non-lifting of my arm did not happen at that first moment when I was wondering about freedom. Time has gone by which I had no power to detain, and the hand which I lifted then and the air through which I lifted it are no longer the same as the air which now surrounds me and the hand that I now decide not to move. Clear now? <laughs> I, I, I think that's much clearer. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> I mean, yeah, essentially actions, actions are based partly on free will and partly on necessity, right? Yeah. And we need to accept that. But ultimately, it seems that once you accept that, you accept that free will is... He, he says towards the end that if, if you think it is based entirely on free will or that free will is the basis for your argument, then it ends up being absurd. But if you believe it's based on the absence of free will, then you arrive at laws. You arrive at, uh, here we go. He says, we must accept dependence on the external world, time, and causation in order to arrive at those laws. And so, yes, you get, I guess, that moment, but that moment is still governed on a dependence. So even if it's free will and your actions, your action is also dependent on other things. So it's a mixture. <laughs> yeah, it's always going to be a mixture. But when he says laws, is that is he meaning like laws of probability? Because how could you have like... I mean, he gets to it, but he, the laws of nature are the laws of God. Yeah. Tolstoy wants history to be like gravity where we know exactly what it is and it's proven at like a scientific and mathematical level. But in order to do that, you'd have to you'd have to use some of the same tools, which in this case is essentially calculus is the is the metaphor it keeps using. But we kinda can't get there is what I get out of it. Well yeah. I, I think Tolstoy says it's impossible to get there because you literally have to take into consideration every act by every person throughout history. <laughs> Mm -hmm. In addition to an overarching governing law of God or nature or whatever that also exists. So what is he actually saying? I think it's a little bit of a cop out. <laughs> well, I disagree. I think it's the truth. Oh, no, I, I also agree. It's the truth. But I, oh. I think when he but I, I guess there's there's like the kind of philosophical truth, but he's making a, a specific critique about history or the way that history is told too. So is he is he ultimately saying history doesn't exist or history is a history is a lie or is he saying that there is a there is a way to tell history that is truer if we were if we recognize this? Yeah, so essentially in in calculus if you take uh finite deltas, finite differences, finite uh points, you will get something that the more points you have the the closer you will get to approximating the reality, which only works if you have an infinite number of points. And he's basically saying that history, as defined by man and as created by man, has so few points, it's not even close. And so basically this, this summary, this narrative that we accept will forever just be off because it's, you know, it, it rarely considers, you know, the common man, it rarely considers individuals, it just, it just develops causation based on a couple of major, major people. And then he also argues that the concept that major people are representative of the will of the population they govern is also totally false. So ba that's basically what he's saying, is he's, he's undercutting the whole concept of modern history. Yes, and the first half of Epilogue 2 is just him going through different versions of modern history and people's approaches to and saying, see, this is why this is not accurate or not complete, because they don't understand this or they ignore this, fill in the blank. I want to read... Um, what ended up being one of my favorite quotes, because if you remember in last episode when Nathan started going into cryptocurrency <laughs> and we sort of... How, how'd that work out for you, by the way? <laughs> uh, <laughs> bad timing, bad timing. Bad timing. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, but, you know, I, I honestly, I, th I think the analogy was solid. And you know what? So does fucking Tolstoy. So I will read this. It goes, so far the study of history as part of the human spirit of inquiry has been like money in circulation, notes and coins. Biographies and national histories are like paper money. They can pass and circulate, doing their job without harming anyone and fulfilling a useful function, as long as no one questions the guarantee behind them. And as long as no one questions precisely how the will of heroes is supposed to direct events, historical works by Thiers and his ilk will retain a certain interest and educational value, not to mention the odd touch of poetry. But just as doubts about the validity of banknotes can arise, like Nathan's Dogecoin, 
<laughs> either when too many go into circulation because they are so easy to make, mm -hmm. or because of a sudden rush to convert them into gold, in the same way doubts about the real value of this type of historical work will arise, either when too many of them are written, or when some naive person asks the simple question, precisely what force was it that made it possible for Napoleon to do that? In other words, when someone wishes to change a working note for the pure gold of a valid concept. And thus, I proclaim, Nathan... I win. You won by comparing this to <laughs> cryptocurrency. <laughs> and Tolstoy predicted Dogecoin. That's incredible. I mean, it's Everybody just, go out and buy you know, some. it's all... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and help Nathan recuperate it's his the, losses. The gold standard for history. <laughs> It's not a loss if I don't sell. <laughs> yeah, you're in it for long term. Uh, so uh, let's tangent back to the Kutuzov topic, because I think this meshes well with this concept. So Kutuzov's actions or inactions, which mm. are they? If Tolstoy almost in some ways is sort of maybe not rehabilitating, but shining light on Kutuzov as a important figure, at the same time, he seems to... He being Kutuzov, the character, seems to not really go against the grain. He's basically using the momentum or forces that the actions already kind of have in motion. So is he an example of free will or not, or the law? How does he get both? It seems to me that, and I think we talked about this last time a little bit with, actually, I think this is how we ended up on Dogecoin, but the idea of, of memes or maybe more appropriately, um, the zeitgeist, like the spirit of the moment. And Tolstoy talks about, I think, the the spirit of the army, that you can sense whether the army, somehow that the army in mass has the energy to engage or not. So maybe what he's saying is that Kutuzov understood the zeitgeist of the army and understood that the army was not... Um, somehow psychically prepared to engage the French. I don't know that he says that exactly, but he did talk about that a lot when they did when they engaged at Borodino, which was the decisive battle that, you know, depending on the historian, they won or lost, but that, that crippled well, the French military. I think Tolstoy rips that idea apart that they would win or lose in one place, that it's all of these events coming together. And Kutuzov is, maybe there is some connection to the army as a whole, but Kutuzov, I think, is a better representative of this, because he, he does have free, he exudes free will by deciding not to engage in certain places, to pull back. It's almost mm -hmm. like Kutuzov is this, like, lightning rod for combination of free will and determinism. He's just kind of, like, waiting for this moment that he knows will come, and why he knows it or how he knows it is never clear. But I, I think it's interesting and I think a little bit maybe um, dishonest, maybe, that Tolstoy, he seems, I mean, th this is the impression that I got, and that he seems to say that Kutuzov is that, what you're talking about, David, and that Napoleon represents some opposite of that, some person who saw themselves as, a, as an independent free will who can, through genius and planning, move the course of history independent of... Mm. I'll keep using the word zeitgeist because it's convenient, independent of the zeitgeist. And it, that just doesn't seem reasonable at all to me that both of these men were caught up in a different sort of zeitgeist and in different places and they're different people. But I don't know, does that make sense? Because it's like, oh man, because the fact is Napoleon did conquer so much of Europe, march all the way into Russia. Like, the idea that he did that of his own volition and free will and in human force, independent of acknowledging the zeitgeist of the moment, and then to say that that because Kutuzov kind of acquiesced and followed this mysterious force, he repelled him, and that indicates that Kutuzov well, had the force and Napoleon didn't. I was going to say, even though Napoleon ultimately failed in his conquering of Russia, it's undoubtable that he altered the course of history. But could you? argue that what he did was based on his free will but also out of necessity just like Kutuzov's non-actions were based on his free will but also out of the necessity that has the causation based on all of the other factors outside of them eh? I mean one could argue that but I think Nathan is asking does Tolstoy paint Napoleon as that character or does 
right? Because it that's, seems to me, and I agree with what, what you were starting to say, yeah. Nathan, is that Tolstoy sort of portrays Napoleon as someone who seems to be fighting against or refusing to go with the flow of this progression of history, that he seems to be fighting against something, right? But But see, I almost think that Tolstoy is trying to unravel a little bit of, you know, the Napoleon story. Mm. Because, you know, there's scenes uh, earlier in the novel where, you know, when when Napoleon gets sick and he, he basically blames everything on his sickness. Mm. Or in this volume, this last volume, when uh, he starts to make his non-genius um, uh, decisions and actions. Yeah. Essentially, there was kind of this this concept that Napoleon really was this force of, of changing history. And I think Tolstoy is trying to get at the fact that, you know, the, the things that Napoleon did that, that changed history, we attribute to Napoleon. And then Napoleon's failures, we basically attribute to, I don't know, I guess the Russian forces, history. But he, he, I think he's kind of saying you can't have both, right? Napoleon either must be somebody who both, you know, was capable of these things and also capable of failure or he was just doing actions but all of those were ultimately tied into the entire integration of history and therefore all of the dependencies upon them so i think he's almost trying to get rid of that like classic napoleon tale of look at this you know single all-powerful man who has changed everything i think he's threading the needle a little bit differently there i think he is but it, it almost I mean, it's it's like a I don't know. It's it's hard to know how Napoleon was talked about at the time, but it would seem to me that it would be difficult to talk about Napoleon or his his successes or conquest without talking about the French Revolution, for instance, or the the movement of democracy and the the ideal idealism of democracy and how that wouldn't have influenced the his rise and and maybe the the nation's capitulation before him because he came to symbolize or he came to symbolize the zeitgeist of the moment yeah right we're essentially by having this conversation without those parts we're failing to take enough points to actually get to the laws of history that created napoleon well early on in epilogue one i'm just going to read two little passages and it's it's a long thing and it it's, talks about greatness and glory and chance with napoleon it says, along comes a man with no convictions, no customs, no traditions, no name, not even a Frenchman. And he works his way, seemingly by a series of curious chances, through the ferment of party conflict in France, and ends up in a prominent position without attaching himself to any particular party. He finds himself in charge of the army, and then it kind of goes on and on. And then later on it says, chance contingencies, millions of them, bring him to power. And all men now seem to collude in asserting his authority. It is chance that determines the personalities of those who rule France at this time, and now cringe before him. Chance that determines the personality of Paul I in Russia, who recognizes his authority. Chance that sets up a plot against him, that enhances his power instead of bringing him down. Chance delivers the Duc de Anguin, I don't know how to pronounce that, into his hands and somehow... And it, it just This whole section about Napoleon is just talking about how I mean, it is. It's undermining this idea of him being this genius and sort of setting up this idea that all of these other contingencies must occur for this person to exist, for this person to change history. There's there's so many other things that happen that we don't measure and can't measure. I just feel like he comes down very hard on Napoleon, and it's like he he later <laughs> says that you can't have one without the other. So it's there, there is this huge component of chance, but then there's also this individual who made the right decision or made a certain decision or uh, neglected to make a certain decision that responded in such a way to these events beyond his control that continued to propel him to the position that he came to. I, I feel like, and maybe because he's responding to a popular narrative about history he comes down very hard on one side about napoleon that he had nothing to do with this it was all chance and on the other side of, with kutuzov who who for whom i think history would say it was in kutuzov it was a combination of you know i one kutuzov rose to power it, i think it was generally understood that he rose to power through no skill of his own it was because he schmoozed with you know a high class of society and accidentally ended up there 
that he failed to make any decision and got lucky because because Napoleon made a bad decision and Winter came and knocked them out. And so Tolstoy comes in and says, no, he's also, the individual Kutuzov is also instrumental in this. So he, I think he comes down on one side with Kutuzov, here's somebody who's instrumental, other side with Napoleon, here's somebody who was governed by chance and thought he was instrumental. So sorry, I, it's not that it's just chance though. Tolstoy doesn't just say it's only chance. He's saying all of these things are a part of it and Napoleon's decision-making is also a part of it. I mean, he criticizes Napoleon's decision-making. You can't criticize a choice if you don't believe in choice. Well, right, but I think he says he says Napoleon is basically an idiot who thought he was a... He, he's, a he's a nihilistic idiot who thought he was a, a genius leader of the people who happened by chance to come to this position. And when he was finally confronted honestly by the Russian forces, it was demonstrated that he had just gotten there by chance, right? I think what makes a lot of this so hard to pin down, this goes back to my comment where I'm like, it's a cop out, which I love. I totally love this book, by the way. So that's not <laughs> me being negative. It's just that, yeah, he really doesn't, he really doesn't say exactly one thing. And actually, I even want to read the section where Kutuzov uh, dies to kind of prove this point from the other side. And so Tosa writes, the movement of men from west to east was to be followed by a movement of men from east to west. And this new war needed a new proponent with aims and qualities that differed from Kutuzov's and a different kind of motivation. Alexander I was as necessary for the movement of men from east to west and the determination of new national frontiers as Kutuzov had been necessary for the salvation and glory of Russia. Kutuzov had no understanding of what was meant by Europe the balance of power, and Napoleon. All of this was beyond him. For this representative of the Russian people, once the enemy had been annihilated and Russia had been liberated and raised to the highest pinnacle of glory, for this true Russian there was nothing left to do. For this representative of the national war there was nothing left to do but die. And die he did. And I like basically that end paragraph anyway, just kind of the quiet death. But essentially they're, they're talking about how, how it's not these individuals who are creating history, but history who is, has this momentum and the individuals fit into it. But at the same time in, in that passage, he talks about Kutuzov being a representative of the Russian people, which is also <laughs> a thing that in epilogue part two, he says that that's not real, that these leaders don't actually represent the will of the people. That's a, a false connection to simplify history. And that's what... And so I don't want to be like... There's contradictions all yeah. over the place. But oh, he, there's plenty he just, of contradictions everywhere. He, yeah, <laughs> he just cycles back and forth on these things, and I think it's why it's fucking great to talk about because he never just tells you exactly. Because I think at the end of the day, nobody knows exactly. Well, and I think we're we're we are looking at it. We're kind of doing what Tolstoy sort of rages against in Epilogue One, which is we're focused on the historical aspects and how you'll never get anywhere. And I think. Where his sort of ideas shine the best are in the actual characters. Yes. And I think the book, mm -hmm. Reluctant Hero, I don't know what you want to call him, but Pierre, I think exemplifies this idea of free will and cultural and historical and everything outside of himself determinism. He is just bombarded by all of these other things, and he still makes his own choices, but those choices are certainly influenced by everything around him. Right? Yeah. Even from the very beginning when he marries... Ellen, it just kind of happens to him. He makes the choice, but he doesn't fully understand why he made it. And he had all these people sort of influencing him to our uh, our weird country bumpkin soothsayer in prison who, like, <laughs> alters his perception of reality. He's like, oh, I'm thinking too much. I just got to live simply. You know, it's, it's, I don't know. Pierre is such an interesting character because I think he represents what Tolstoy is kind of talking about. Yeah. It's just that you're not one thing. So I, I've been trying not to bring up Spinoza in this conversation so far, but I, <laughs> I could feel you trying not to bring we all, up Spinoza. We all know you're addicted. Just just get it out. Uh, so this this book led me on a path. Um, he mentions Tolstoy mentions um, a philosopher at the end, Schelling, who was a, a German idealist, and that kind of led me in this progression eventually back to Spinoza, who was a. I got a Spinoza quote here. From Tolstoy. Okay, I, you have a Spinoza quote from sorry. Tolstoy? No, 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 no. It's It reads like something Spinoza would have written. It's, 
In Epilogue 1, it says, Just as the sun and every atom of ether is both a sphere complete in itself, and also a tiny part of an inconceivably vast whole, so every personality bears within himself his own aims, whilst bearing them also in the service of generalized aims that lie beyond human comprehension. Spot on. Yeah. Um, yeah. But I, I found a lot of parallel ideas in the, the little that I've learned of Spinoza, to be perfectly honest. And I couldn't find if Tolstoy ever read Spinoza, but the character of Pierre, I think, is a is a great representation of how he changes his relationship with maybe his fate or with the inevitable. And how in his fighting against it, he finds himself swept along, married to Hélène. Kind of, he thinks he's making that choice, but he doesn't actually understand what choices are available to him, and how his progression later in his his second marriage to Natasha, how that, even though he's still a, a human being caught up in events beyond his control, somehow that second decision is a freer decision than the first decision. And in Spinoza's philosophy, I think what what Pierre attains. And what Platon had is um, this idea of the blessed life, and that is recognizing that you don't have total control, recognizing that there is that there is some some degree of inevitability, recognizing that that you have to submit in certain ways, and then when you have that right relationship, you can. I don't know. This is where it gets messy, and where um, maybe our readers should go pick up some Spinoza. <laughs> is this the proper spot to interject and say that you are now working on your meditation app where you just read Spinoza? <laughs> For a low, low fee every month, you can listen to me read some Spinoza. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, that, all that all that checks out. Yeah, I've come to love Pierre as well, even though he's not he's not my character. I'm not Team Pierre. <laughs> but uh, what would the opposing team be? T- Andre. Team Andre. Ah. Team Andre was determinism to a fault. And look where it got him. You got a tiny Pierre moment at the end. Wait, wait, to, uh, break that open a little bit for me. So Andre was so, um, let me use determinist, determinism again. He was so deterministic in his actions and in his willpower that he essentially was trying to go against the grain, against these structures, maybe put himself into these situations. And that was what ultimately kind of broke him down versus Pierre, who hit your Spinoza-style level of acceptance to just essentially go with the stream of events and the stream of history where he went on an extremely roundabout path that nobody would have advised, but at the same time, he emerged in a more, I don't know, contented, more more happy endpoint. Well, I could make the opposite argument to that, actually. Be, I mean... I, I agree with you that they that they do kind of represent this sort of like yin yang relationship, but arguably different sides of Tolstoy. What the word on the street arguably, is. <laughs> but uh, Andre, <laughs> we get to see how Andre's story ends, and at the end of his story, he has total acceptance. Like he he's so completely accepting of his own death that he no longer tries to fight it, and quite the opposite, tries to play the role of a living person for those around him because he was so at peace with his imminent demise and kind of becomes this kind of one with love, which I think either in, in Tolstoy's universe or in Spinoza's, I think that is a, that is the, the, I don't know what you want to call it. The blessed life, the, the, the union with, with the, the whole. Um, Whereas Pierre does get to that point at the end of the book but then in the epilogue, we see him getting involved in this um, secret society. So Pierre still Pierreing. Mm-hmm. Well, there's a whole. I mean, yeah, we're we're attributing Pierre behaviors to Pierre and Andre behaviors to Andre. But throughout the whole book, they they often swap, right? I mean, remember the first couple of volumes where, you know, there were points where Andre was ecstatic and and in love with life, whereas Pierre was, you know wallowing in his corpulence and meeting this meaninglessness um mm. so i i think i think there is almost like you said that yin yang that that push pull where they they sort of have a fixed amount of the blessed life to go between mm-hmm. them almost <laughs> and it sort of shifts and i think if you view them as two sides of of the same person or the same concept like they ultimately equal out together i, th- I think that's also mirrored 
although not as explicitly in the two sort of female leads at the end of the book, Natasha and Maria. Because you don't see a lot of them through the, throughout the book, but you see them sort of go through similar experiences of elation and personal choice and then sort of going with the flow and the the influence that they're I think more directly especially like familial influence on their lives as opposed to their own choices Mm -hmm. and maybe that's most pointed in the character of Sonia oh yeah oh yeah poor Sonia poor Sonia who seems to be who seems to exemplify this kind of like she's a very loving character she's very accepting of her fate um, and I, you know, I guess she's, she's kind of like Job. Like you can be, you can be righteous and still get the shaft. Yeah. I mean, just because you accept the momentum doesn't mean that you get the blessed life. Sometimes the blessed life is shit. I can't remember where, but there's, they assign this biblical quote to Sonia. Right? Oh yeah. Um, to everyone who has more will be given and those who don't have even that will be, or and then those that don't have e- what they have will be taken away. Kind of, I can't remember the exact quote. Yeah, I think that, that's the gist of it. Something from Matthew, but yeah, and they sort of assign this to her, and then they talk about how she's still somewhat sort of just content with it. Yeah, like she suffers, but she suffers with dignity, I guess. Yeah, I, I mean, I think that is that is still the blessed life, really. Um, you know, if we if we go back to the coiner of that term. In a lot of ways, he lived a, a pretty shitty existence in in an attic, um, poor, and died of inhaling too much glass dust um, at a fairly young age. And and he believed that he had that he understood what a blessed life was. So it's not necessarily, I guess, about you know, winning the favor of God at the end of it. That's that, that's pretty antithetical to it, really. You know, versus a character. I think we could compare it to a character like like Ellen, who managed to through her clever behavior to to fool all of society to basically get everything that she wanted um marries the richest man in russia but still lives a you know a free life so to speak she's maybe our freest character you know and she goes out on and top she- <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's one way to look at it i mean she goes out high as a kite you guys are taking a remarkably positive take on where Sonia ended up. I mean, he calls her like the sterile flower or something like that. Honestly, she's kind of a casualty of this stuff. That was that was all that her life was ever going to be based on her station in life, right? And that's, yeah, certainly there's an acceptance there. But I felt that was maybe perhaps a downer, if you will. Yeah, no, it was definitely a downer. Yeah, I mean, it's sad. But... So I found, I can't remember where I wrote this down on a little piece of scrap paper, and I think it was somebody talking about Tolstoy's book. And I'm just going to read this quote, so I have no idea who it's coming from. I apologize. (laughs) (laughs) But it kind of gets at what we're getting to at the end here. Uh, Like us, Tolstoy's characters make mistakes, suffer, and hit dead ends. Every once in a while, though, under even the worst circumstances, they experience moments of transcendent bliss or sudden illumination, the comfortable familiarity of their smooth-running lives suddenly disrupted, their perceptions become sharpened, their understanding of what it means to be alive widened. And I think you see that in all of these characters. Mm -hmm. There's no clear path for any of them, and there's so many of them that sometimes they get lost. Like Nick and I were talking before we started that I thought Denisov was dead, (laughs) but he kind of popped up again at the end of the book. (laughs) But... uh, but yeah, you, you just see all, all of these characters just experiencing the breadth of life. Mm-hmm. I, I think that's essentially, that's essentially, well, thank, thank you, unattributed quote person, whoever put that down. <laughs> I agree. Mm. Um, <laughs> we're heavily researched. But yeah. that's, a, that's, a, that's the magic of this book is that, mm-hmm. you know, Tolstoy is essentially tackling like the small histories and the big history with a capital H at the same time. And it can feel a little jarring, especially, I mean, we, we've been reading this in, in the local reading group, and the majority of people were not down yeah. with <laughs> epilogue part two. And I was just rolling. I was like, this is the greatest thing. I love what he's doing here. He's tying this all together. It's cool. He goes between these different storytelling styles. And it's also this injection of a weird history essay. Like people just 
didn't like it. They were like, man, this is the worst. Why is he still talking about this? He already talked about <laughs> it in the book. And I think it. I think it's brilliant. I think it's sort of a different type of fiction that he did so early before people were even thinking like that. I mean, this is really a combination of, of realism and like historical like essays mixed with those almost just basic, uh, I don't know, romance stories that I would have never read independently. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he just ties it all up, and you get you get it all. You get the micro, and you get the macro. He was adamant that this was not a novel. He said right. he wanted to do something totally different. And he did. Yeah. I, I think it sets the stage for, for a lot of stuff that came after it where people kind of focus in certain aspects. But he kind of did it from this all-inclusive, you know, maximalist type of approach. Which, to be fair, I don't think he necessarily needed <laughs> everything in this book. <laughs> like that whole bees thing. What's the deal with bees? He was a beekeeper, by the oh, way. Oh, was he? Oh, there we go. Up. He he mentioned bees again in the epilogue. It yeah. came back. It came back. It returned. <laughs> He's like, can anyone like come up with a single reason for why bees exist? It's <laughs> like, ah, so why are you fucking still talking about bees? <laughs> Man, what an incredible book, though. Yeah. He also shat on the printed word. What? There, there's. Oh, whole... yeah, I remember. That. I don't know if you remember this. So, like, I got to read this quote because I think it's hilarious. Only in our age of arrogance and the popularization of knowledge, thanks to that most powerful weapon of ignorance, the spread of the printed word, has the question of free will been transferred to new terrain, where it cannot continue to exist as a question. In our day, most of the so-called advanced people, nothing but a bunch of ignoramuses, <laughs> have accepted the research <laughs> of the natural scientists, which is only interested in one side of the question, as a solution to the question as a whole. And I think that's, Nick, where you might call this a cop-out, because he doesn't care about the answer necessarily. He just likes wrestling with the question, because he's not a fucking yeah. ignoramus. I mean, replace yeah. printed word with Twitter. Yeah. And here we are. This book is full of all predictions for everything, yeah. is my end summary. And even though it's not like the style of reading or the style of writing that I typically seek out, it has quickly become one of my favorite books. Yeah. I'm with you on that one. Like I just, I get it. I get why everybody needs to read this. It's true. For real. <laughs> <laughs> well. I, I love it. I love it. I mean, after I finished this book, I watched the, whatever it is, six hour BBC miniseries. Um, and then, you know, his, his philosophical, you know, the last 50 pages or whatever, that sent me down this, like, I'm like, where, where can I read more about these ideas? I'm just, I am neck deep in this, uh, whatever I'm in. I don't know, but, but <laughs> I mean, I would thought, I would have thought after reading 1400 pages, I'd be ready to move on. And I'm just not. Thanks for listening. You can find out more about us at booksofsomesubstance.com and on Instagram and Twitter with the handle books o substance. And as always, if you can, click some buttons on the internet for reviews and likes and all that good stuff. Every little bit helps. Until next time, happy reading. Are you saying I was putting you to sleep? That's not what I was saying. I was just saying it, it had a vibe.